Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr and I am uh, Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO or Open Communications for the Ocean. And we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on addressing ocean sewage pollution, financing wastewater treatment upgrades at scale. Um, this is, webinar is organized by the Conservation Finance Alliance's Marine and Coastal Finance Working Group. And um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know um, there's going to be two ways to interact. So we'll have the initial presentation um, and then we'll have the Q&A from the audience. So if you have questions for the panelists, um, we're going to ask that you put those into the question panel specifically, and it's much easier for us to organize and uh, go through those questions. But we would also love to hear from you, your um, any relevant resources you know of, your thoughts and opinions, we'll be asking for input during the webinar. And we'd love for you to put those into the chat um, and you can make them visible. You can choose whether only the hosts and panelists can see them, or you can choose whether those are visible to all attendees. And so we welcome you to share um, anything that's relevant to the conversation in the chat. We just ask that you keep it prof professional there. Um, so I will, this is webinar is being facilitated by Joss Hill. Um, Joss, it chairs the Conservation Finance Alliance's Marine and Coastal Finance Working Group. Um, and her day job is with the US Conservation Project at the Pew Charitable Trusts. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joss to uh, introduce Tanya and Roderick. Fantastic, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so the goal of this webinar and others um, in the series is to explore how and where to build capacity to increase use of conservation finance tools in uh, conservation. So we have two fantastic speakers um, for you today, uh, Tanya Amea and Roderick Hodges. Uh, after they've given their presentations, so we're gonna run them one after the other. Um, uh, as Sarah said, we'll have time for Q&A. So as she mentioned, please put your questions in the Q&A box uh, for the presenters, um, but please feel free to have a discussion amongst yourselves or share resources in the chat. So first, I will introduce Tanya Amaya, who is the Regional Program Director for the Western Caribbean at the Coral Reef Alliance. Um, so trained as an environmental engineer, Tanya is dedicated to promoting innovative solutions for conservation, and in her current role, she supports Coral's efforts to promote uh, coral conservation through strategic initiatives and sanitation, marine protected area management, and sustainable tourism. Um, so I'll introduce Roderick later, and over to you, Tanya. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great being here. I don't know, Joss, if you want me to just share the, the presentation. Okay, cool. So this is very exciting, not just for me, but for everyone who's involved in this story. Um, this is definitely not just a story of Coral's work. It's the story of a community, and specifically the West End community in Rattan Bay Islands, Honduras. So just to share a little bit of who we are, we're the Coral Reef Alliance. We have a mission to build alliances to save the world's coral reefs. And our vision is also connected to seeing how we can create a world where they are kept healthy and by reducing a lot of the stressors, including uh, pollution, uh, which is what we're gonna talk a lot more about in the next slides. But what we want them to do is to be able to adapt to climate change and any threats that might come and that's also connected to our theory of change. So as I mentioned before, we try to uh, make sure that our efforts go into keeping coral reefs healthy and have them adapt to climate change. And we do that through strategies, working a lot with partners. I feel like the name of the organization already gives you that idea. We work through partnerships and alliances on regional, global, and local scales. And we have many strategies, but today we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into clean water for reefs. And that's the work that we have been doing. And it's pretty much our, our model and one that we'll try to replicate. Uh, we believe that it is something that can be adaptable. And I'm gonna show you what the work in West End has been so far. Uh, but before we go through some of the slides where we can see the plan and the situation uh, that we encountered when we first started start collaborating with the community, I want to share some facts. 
and one is that it's a community-based management model. We know that there can be many mo management models. Some can be central government uh, run facilities, or they can be private uh, private owned wastewater treatment plants and sanitation systems. You could also have a group of municipalities investing and in managing their plants. So what we're uh, dealing with here is a community-based management model that it's also a nonprofit. Uh, when it comes to mechanics of the plant is an activated sludge treatment plant that was modified to have extended aeration to provide uh, an enhanced biological treatment. But that is also another long story. The plant began as a very basic infrastructure that required a lot of investment to make sure that we could also reach that part where we have uh, a proper aeration system. Um, but I'm gonna talk about it also a little bit later on. And this wastewater treatment plant that you can see here to your right is the one that we're managing uh, that we're supporting to be managed right now. Um, it's in the community of West End, as you can see. It has some solar panels uh, that do provide a lot of relief when it comes to operations. And I wanted to share also that picture because you can see that the community is really close to the plant, but that's uh, one into settlement that was established a little bit after the construction of the plant. But also something that's worth highlighting is that there are very little disturbances by having the wastewater treatment plant here, which is something that you might assume is a, is a problem, but we don't have any complaints when it comes to noises from the pumping station. So if anyone's ever been to West End, right as you enter the community, there's a kiosk, but that's actually one of the pumping stations and it's something that you can't even notice. So I wanted to mention that. And that's what happens when a lot of work goes into having these facilities function the way that they should. Uh, so all of that makes sure that at least 30 million gallons of raw sewage don't enter the ocean. And that also results in, the, in a total reduction of fecal indicator bacteria in the areas where the plant is having some coverage. So as a result, West End meets quality standards, such as the Honduran technical norms, but also uh, stricter regulations like the Cartagena Convention. And that allows also West End, West End to have Half Moon Bay Beach, which has been awarded as an ecological blue flag beach since 2019. And it continues to happen um, every year. So the foundation of this management model and the story that we're gonna listen to right now is based on uh, community needs. So around 2006, there was a lot of discomfort from the community. They felt like they needed a change uh, because they had two separate systems. So they had to be merged into one. However, that came with a set of challenges, including the need to have a water association. So um, governance when it comes to sanitation is something that's also very important because it might be very appealing to just have uh, investments for infrastructure. And that's the cool part, right? Sometimes uh, building a wastewater treatment plant or a sanitation system and cutting the ribbon and taking the pictures, but what happens then? So you do need to invest in governance as well. Um, so Polo's Water Association was created. It inherited some debt when it came to electricity bills from the plant. The plant was built by the municipality and then was handed over to the community. So from 2006 until 2023, we have been working consistently with the Water Association, starting by uh, supporting their organization, also making sure that they went through all the legal process to be uh, uh, acknowledged as a water and sanitation service provider, which also is also something that a lot of people don't can't afford to do, but that's something that uh, I'll talk also a, li a little bit about later on. So these are some of the images that um, appear when the connections were being made. Right now we have at least 99% of all the homes in West End. The part that's missing is the part that requires a higher investment when it comes to making sure that they can uh, make the discharge to the wastewater treatment plant. However, those are the ones that are farther from uh, the shoreline. So these are some of the, the images. It was a long process. It wasn't easy. Uh, none of this is easy, but it's doable. It's doable in, in a, at least a 10, 
12 year investment to make sure that we are where we are right now, which is a, a pretty much a state of the art uh, wastewater treatment facility. I like to share this slide because this represents something that was a wild dream around 2020. Um, one, because we did a performance assessment of the plant and we identified some improvements that were needed. Um, if you see there, there's a, a the nitrification tank. And also I, I wanna highlight that this is a very short, it's a very small property. So we're dealing with 660 square meters uh, of area to do all the treatments that we need to do. And as you've seen um, on the field, usually a wastewater treatment plant is a lot larger, but we've been able to make sure that we can cater to this community of West End by having uh, this facility. So this was, all, this is almost impossible in 2020, right when COVID hit is when we needed to start working on it. Uh, but we did encounter a lot of challenges and that's why a lot of soft funding was needed to make sure that we continue uh, being able to cover for operation costs, make sure that the staff uh, was kept, no one was laid off uh, during COVID-19. Uh, but we also acknowledged that we needed to work on some on a plan to make sure that we could optimize all the resources and that required a little bit of investment as well. Uh, but one of the first things that was done was uh, fundraising to make sure that we could have an office there. Uh, initially, Polos was renting uh, a commercial space, uh, but that took a toll on the budget as well. It also required additional internet collection, connection, additional in, um, electricity connections as well. So uh, there was this decision to, one, invest a lot in fundraising, so joining efforts with Polos, with other donors, such as the, as the Marfa and the Summit Foundation, and other donors that wanted to make sure that we didn't, uh, we didn't see Polos in a situation where everything that was accomplished so far uh, was, gonna, was going to end. So uh, this is a container that in the end ended up being the office for the Polos Water Association. It's completely uh, finalized. This is probably from late 2021. And also this, another um, improvement area that we identified was how, what do we do with the aeration system? Because it was really expensive. It required a lot of electricity. It kept being damaged. So we also applied for funding to make sure that we could have a fine bubble diffuser, which is, are the ones that you can see here and make sure that we had a more um, stabilized aeration and also some reductions in the cost. Uh, but also one of the things that I want to highlight is the fact that this facility doesn't does not just provide uh, work opportunities for people from the community, but it's also a way to empower women and put them on leadership position. So here you can see an image that has um, the administrator, the project coordinator as well, who is also a sanitation consultant, uh, the new president of the board, and also Jenny Maiton, our conservation program director, who has been supporting Polos Water Association from the start. So uh, this was a very happy day when we were able to see how that new system started working and made sure that everything and all the concerns that we had were when it came to that final process, because remember, we can't have a biofilter because it's such a small area, but ideally, uh, Polos can acquire some land in the future and have a biofilter to make sure that as the community grows, uh, they can cater to a larger population, but also a higher visitation because West End is one of the hot spots for tourism, not just in, in Rotan, but in the Western Caribbean. And here's a look through the years. So this is 2011 when the plant was built, then 2017 when we had some improvements, as you can see, there's new roofing, which is something that we have to invest on in the future. And I, I talk about we a lot because it's something that we do together. And this is where we are in 2023. When it comes to investment, these are some of the numbers that we're dealing with. So just in infrastructure, it's about 2.9 million US dollars. And that does not include everything that's gone into 
uh, creating some of the systems that go around like water quality monitoring and, or what happened when you had to establish a water association. Uh, what's the role of the central government? Because a lot of those visits, the central government will do, and they have been a great partner, but they don't have the funds to go all the way to the Bay Islands because it's it's usually a, a problem that arises that the technical staff in the government institutions uh, has limited funding as well, and they're uh, understaffed. So that's where also we have to come in and make sure that we can maintain those connections. Uh, 540 thousand US dollars in technical assistance so that we can make sure that we have this management model support. So that's having the project coordinator, uh, support from organizations such as HRI, Coral, Bika, and water quality monitoring that always goes into this part of technical assistance that doesn't include performance assistance or consultancies that have been made to support the plan. Because what happened also is that this plan when it was handed over to the community, there there was the need to hire someone to support in operation of the plan. But as years went by and expertise was gained, that was no longer a scenario where it was needed. So the association is now operating, administrating, managing, and fundraising for the plan. So that requires a lot of support as well. And those panels that you see right there, uh, now there's a total of 98 panels and they, do wonders when it comes to daytime energy consumption reduction. Uh, and you can see at least a 50% uh, decrease in what they used to pay for electricity, including the new office that is now operating there. Uh, I think that it's also interesting to make, because when we thought about the office, we were thinking about uh, cost effectiveness, but then you realize that it's also a matter of transparency. And just for the community to be able to go there and make that payment and see the investments because policy is under construction a lot of the time. Uh, so I feel like this creates this sense of, of transparency and also belonging to the plan because you can see your funds going into investments. Uh, income sources for the plants are fee collection self-funding a lot, um, grants as well, but we do acknowledge the need to invest in income diversification projects. So uh, there has there have been talks about uh, compost and what can, can happen, but that's something that we are looking at because it's it's been an interesting journey for the plan. But here are some key elements that I wanna highlight about this model. And one is that is, it's very connected to science. Science is used to inform planning, management, and fundraising. We've been doing water quality monitoring alongside BICA for over, I would say, 10 years now, especially, yeah, this year it's 10 years of us doing that work. Uh, also, community engagement and transparency, as I mentioned, just one of the indicators is uh, knowing that the community can go and see the plan and not complain that it smells bad, that nothing's happening. That's always good to know. Investment on both improved governance and infrastructure. As I mentioned before, you can have uh, the most modern and efficient facility, but if you don't build a system where it's gonna be properly operated, managed, and the community or the customers or beneficiaries, whatever, however you want to see that, uh, are not a part of that solution, then is most likely not going to have um, any investments or improvements, or it's going to struggle significantly with fee collection if that's the the business model that you're looking at. So it's important to in, in to invest in governance and capacity building as well. Uh, building a strong network of partners. Uh, Polos has been supported by the private sector, public sector, conservation NGOs. So that in the end. Um, it promotes collaborative planning, fundraising, and problem solving. So what you see here, as, as I was talking about in the beginning, it's not a story of Polos or West End. It's a story of many organizations that decided to support, advocate, and invest for the wastewater treatment plant in West End. Also overcoming roadblocks. We've seen many. Uh, one of them is limited access to funding through private banking. Uh, there are interest rates up to like 30% because it's not seen as a business. It, it, you would have to pretty much apply as a personal loan 
Um, so the solution was, okay, then let's bring in a project coordinator. Let's put in a lot more work from the partners and uh, have a little bit more uh, of an intensive fundraising campaign. And as a result of that, Polos was able to be out of any of the debts that it had, that it inherited by 2022, which leaves it in a very good uh, position to, to start fresh. Uh, also creating employment opportunities. Yeah, that's something that we talked about too. Uh, making sure that there is inclusion and that you can uh, provide sources of income and livelihood for members of the community and its vulnerable groups. Some highlights that are a, a mix of conclusions and recommendations, one by investing in sanitation and wastewater treatment. You invest in community well-being and reef conservation, and, and that list can go on and on. Uh, water is necessary for conservation efforts for any species, and you also need it for some of uh, the products and services that an area can provide. So here we're looking at tourism as well. So sometimes these models are connected to, okay, you pay for the water, you have to pay for the wastewater treatment as well. But what happens when you have a community that doesn't, that maybe buys their own water or has their own wealth, then you have to look at the added value and that can be in the form of ecological services. Um, COVID-19 did have a, a hard impact on tourism. Fee collection was down to 25% uh, and that went on from 2020, 2021, and a big part of 2022. Uh, but because of that transparency as well, fee collection uh, is increasing. We know that the, 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 the economy hasn't recovered and we're dealing with inflation everywhere in the world. However, uh, they managed to get it up to 85% and it continues increasing. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have an updated number. And yeah, Polo successfully meets operation costs and salaries. Uh, but we believe also that this is a management model that can be adapted, replicated, or at least inspire some solutions in other uh, communities that might be similar to West End. That includes small island developing states. And what's in store for us when it comes to next steps? One is continue building alliances. We uh, love working with uh, the wastewater treatment plan and the association, but we know where our limits are as a conservation nonprofit. So we'll continue supporting them with fundraising and being an advisor. Uh, so it's nice to see how that role has shifted throughout the years. But now we're also making sure that we can build those connections with the experts that they might have when it comes to legal processes. Um, uh, water and sanitation, uh, the regulations that come with being a water and sanitation service providers or access to funding uh, in support with the support from the central government, both the SANA, CONASA, and ERSAPS, which are government institutions that regulate the water and sanitation uh, sector. So we signed an MOU with them in June, yeah, on June 5th. Uh, so far, we've had two workshops, four technical visits. So our role is mostly to support um, with travel expenses, which is not a high cost when you look at the return of investment, which is all this technical assistance, not just for uh, Polos Water Association, but also communities in our field site. So we're very excited about where that can lead because it's been roughly two, two months of that support. And when, we can, when it comes to scaling up, these are some of the things that we're doing at the moment. We know that uh, as... Polos was a long journey. These are going to be long journeys too, but we're more than excited to get started with them. So continue working with West End, uh, filling some information gaps that will support a sustainable model management model in Cox and Hole. Uh, continue supporting in West Bay so that we can have a larger wastewater treatment plant. Right now they have individual uh, systems. Utila and Guanaja, technical assistance also, and identifying sanitation governance and infrastructure needs, which we already started doing. Tela, continue supporting with water quality monitoring. So this year, our um, water mar marine water quality monitoring program has expanded to include uh, Tela and Trujillo as well. And hopefully we'll be able to support Key Cocker addressing their sanitation challenges as well. So that's everything on my end. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. That was great. Um, so we're going to go straight to uh, our next speaker, Roderick Hodges, who's the Director of Investment with Marine Change. Uh, and that's a consultancy focused on impact investments and innovative conservation solutions for coastal and marine ecosystems. He specializes in providing strategic evaluations of sustainable investments, business operations, and prospective policy interventions. And his experience includes uh, fisheries, waste management, aquaculture and mariculture, marine protected areas, and carbon offsets. Thank you. And I'll take over here. Uh, thanks, Joss. Um, so my presentation is about uh, Indonesia's, one of their um, headline uh, sanitation programs that's called Sanimas, and uh, especially the lessons learned over the last 20 years from this program. So I'll jump right in. Um, just a sort of overview of, of the situation in Indonesia. Um, so it's a, a country about 17,000 islands, 250 million people. Uh, and so you can imagine uh, getting sanitation to all of them is, is pretty tough, right? So um, basically the status quo at the moment is you have open defecation um, by about 10% of the population. Um, you have unimproved sanitation for about another 25% of the population. And by unimproved, it just means it's um, whatever form it takes, it, it more or less discharges directly into the environment. So you can imagine this along coastlines uh, or the banks of rivers. Um, and then another 60% of households, uh, they use septic, they use toilets and septic tanks. Um, but the, the design um, means that, you know, they're not, uh, they're still leaking to the environment uh, to a certain extent. There's also a desludging issue, meaning they're not desludged regularly, and you can have leakage from that, of course. I um, also just want to highlight that you know, sewer connections are, are very low across the country. We're talking you know, less than 4% of the overall population. So really, we're going to be talking about septage uh, in this presentation, and that's what Sunny Moss is as well. Um, again, just to touch a little bit more on septage, um, basically on the, on the transport side, you have a lot of provi service providers, both in the public and private sector. It's a very sort of complex uh, landscape, you could say. Um, but even some areas that are quite well touristed and well known, like Gili Islands, which is uh, pretty close to Bali, um, they're not serviced by any sort of sludge, tre um, sludge treatment, let alone sludge treatment, but even the, um, the, the transport, basically, the, the trucks. Um, there's a few drivers to this. First, you have just low low understanding from at the community level. So you just you know low lack of knowledge in terms of impacts of, of poorly managed uh, waste. So that means you have low demands, uh, very low willingness to pay. Um, so it, it's a pretty tough uh, situation. Um, even for areas where it exists, you have issues, especially in the private sector, of dumping just in, into the environment. Um, you know, the regulations are mostly there, um, but they're just not, they're just not un enforced really. Um, and I'll keep sort of beating this drum. There's, there's an issue with operational and maintenance or O&M uh, funding um, across the board. This is on, in the private sector and on the, on the, um, on the public uh, side. Um, and this is related to lots of different things, including um, just lack of knowledge about, about impacts here. Also, just want to talk about treatment. Um, so, of course, there's very different, various different ways you can you can treat uh, septage. Um, but just want to highlight here that you know other infrastructures can impact your ability to do so. Um, so, if you have electrical outages or just lack of connection in certain areas, you know that limits your options or it can impact your your operations of your facility. Um, overall, as well, there's just a lack of, of facilities across Indonesia. Um, and for those areas or those facilities that do exist, uh, it was found that just 10% of them actually are operating uh, optimally. Um, so a, a really challenging sort of situation, um, you know, that's related to, again, capacity, uh, funding. Um, those are the, sort of the main, we'll say, we'll say drivers of this. And of course, demand as well. And again, I'll, I'll keep I'll basically keep repeating repeating these sort of uh, key key elements as I as I go along here. Uh, so, just want to summarize the the Sanimas program. So, it's a it's an acronym in in Bahasa Indonesia. 
uh, but in English, it's community-based sanitation. Um, so the three key elements are that one, it's community-based. So it's actually within the communities, it's just a distributed uh, um, sort of model, essentially. Um, it's small scale. Um, and it's decentralized across the country. Um, so each system targets about 50 to 200 households. Um, so it's it's more or less a septic tank that is shared across uh, communities, uh, and across a single community, but across households. Um, so basically, it's works like a septic tank, right? So you have um, the solid and, and liquid waste that's that's de uh, deposited into the into the system. Um, the the solids then sink to the bottom. Um, the uh, the liquids then go to another chamber, and then eventually. It's, uh, it's released as effluent, uh, which of course needs to be tested uh, to make sure that it's uh, it's safe for um, for the environment. Um, some key sort of design issues here uh, is that you know it's meant to be really owned and um, you know operated by by the community. Um, so the community has has things that they have to do. They have to supply the land for, for the systems themselves. Um, they need to provide the labor uh, to build the system and maintain the systems over time. Uh, and they're meant to provide the funding for, for O&M, including the sludging. Um, the requirements also to have a system um, uh, have a system installed in your in your community is that you connect that the community agrees to connect their homes their toilets to the systems and then to use these toilets um, and the group that is meant in each community to to manage it's called a beneficiary maintenance group uh, in Bahasa it's a it's KPP um, so you know so far so good right in theory it seems like it all should be working properly um, and just to give an idea you know about a billion dollars has been spent on these systems since 2002 across multiple different programs um, at the national level and provincial and city levels. Um, and to date, well, to date, I should say, as of 2019, uh, there are around 6 million people being served by Sanimas programs. So a bit of the background and the history of, of the different programs, just briefly here. So you had, uh, you know, the initial pilot that was done, it was sort of heavily sort of uh, foreign focused, right? You have the Australians, the World Bank, uh, German NGO involved. Um, that built about six systems initially in the, in the pilot uh, uh, sort of phase. Then after that, you have the Ministry of Public Works getting involved. Uh, so, you know, Indonesian government has really sort of owned this more or less since, uh, since the beginning. Um, so... And then the most recent um, program was with Islamic Development Bank. Um, it ended in 2019. So overall, there are about 20,000 systems built across the country. Um, you see the total investment there. And then just as uh, just FYI, basically, but it's around 30,000 uh, USD per, per location, per system. Uh, and in the Indonesian government's five-year plan um, that will ending it's ending next year, but you know this was their plan over the over the five-year period. Um, the it's to build about thirty thousand more systems at a cost of three thousand uh, three billion dollars more, uh, connecting another one point four million households, and focused on about one hundred seventy locations across the country. So they've really gone, you could say, all in on 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 these programs. Um, and because you have so much data, you have so many different, uh, sort of systems that have been operating for so long, you can, it gives you, um, just really interesting perspective on, uh, how things, uh, have gone to date. Um, so some really interesting lessons learned, and that's really the, the meat of the presentation here. Um, so I'm going to be presenting not work that, that I've done on myself at, by any means. Um, this is just taking, taken from a study that was commissioned, but from the Islamic Development Bank. Um, on the latest phase of the Sanimas and um, some really sort of interesting sort of findings here that hopefully can uh, can sort of educate the efforts going forward. Um, so I'll just go here. There's, there's a litany of things here. So I'll sort of go through them quickly. So you had about half of Sanimas systems had serious challenges. 
Um, so some, you know, some pretty, some sobering results here. Um, in terms of, you know, communities being able to tell the local governments, you know, if something isn't operating uh, properly, three quarters of them didn't have any sort of um, complaint mechanism in place. Um, you still had, you know, at the at the sites that they looked at, 10% of sites were still practicing open defecation, which if you think back to what um, I originally sort of talked about in terms of status quo, um, this is basically the same as uh, the rest of the country in terms of open, def open defecation rates. Um, inability to, op to cover O&M expenses, that's half of sites. Um, or, or major costs, that's another, it's another aspect as well, apart from O&M. So that's, that's a major issue. You had 7% of the sites just not operating. Uh, you had issue with desludging, not happening at most of sites. Um, basic knowledge about even sanitation or O&M um, topics, even after the training was administered, still not, still major sort of um, uh, knowledge gaps there. Um, you had only a fifth of system uh, systems um, being used at less than half of their treatment capacity. So that's either, that means they were either designed to be too large um, or you had insufficient usage of toilets or insufficient connectivity of, of the toilets with the systems. Um, you had disposal uh, at a third of the sites that was problematic. Uh, you had no operator involved in half of the systems. Um, no, and for those systems that had operators, three quarters didn't have salaries. You have training issues. Um, and even in terms of, of placement, you had 70% of them that were not implemented in areas that were considered to be the most, uh, the most needed, um, known as red zones, or at least in the, the reports terminology. And then you have training issues as well. So it's 95% um, and three quarters of local governments not had received, hadn't received training. So a lot here to, to unpack. Yeah, a lot, a lot happening. So the report gives some really nice um, actionable steps. Uh, uh, we'll say, yeah, just recommendations essentially. So how, how to improve um, sort of the design and the, and the, the operations of these, of these systems going forward. Um, their, their top um, recommendation is in terms of asset ownership. So in theory, it sounds really nice to have the communities actually own it. And you would think that they would, um, you know, maybe uh, that would be an optimal way to, to manage these things. But the issue is they just have, they just lack capacity, lack, they lack funding, they lack awareness and um, they're, they're basically not ready. So uh, the recommendation is that actual local governments would step in um, and by having local governments step in, then the local governments then would also feel the responsibility to, um, to allocate funding toward yeah, O&M uh, the budgets and and sort of getting these up and running uh, as they should be, uh, but that's not a panacea. But it, it, I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, just a brief one here on uh, wastewater effluent. So actually, the the effluent from these systems doesn't meet Indonesian water quality standards, uh, the the newest standards. So it um, suggests rolling those back to I think pre uh, like 2014 levels. Um, the reason it, it suggests that rather than uh, um, changing the design is that uh, updating, updating the design can increase costs by a lot, maybe 10x. So sort of, you know, the, um, the easiest way to go would just be to, uh, to give a, a waiver essentially to these systems. Um, also, just in terms of, of government, um, uh, government mandates to be involved. So just, you know, getting everyone, um, getting all the different relevant ministries involved in this, um, just, you know, more cooperation at the, at the, um, uh, across different government levels to align yeah, real stakeholders. Um, also just in terms of local governments, um, strengthening their, their management units. So basically a, a local utility, just some sort of a local unit that is, um, that's, responsible for these things um, that has capacity and budget. Um, something else that they found was that of all these different systems that have been uh, installed over time, there's not a central database of where they are and, and what's going on. So that's, I think that's a, a key a sort of issue as well. Um, looking at technical designs, 
uh, looking at government and both government and community readiness criteria, um, just, you know, basic real, like, you know, just how, what are the, what is your sort of, um, what's your O&M plan uh, in terms of, you know, how are you going to do everything? It's, it seems like this, um, the focus here was really on building, but it wasn't, it wasn't focused on what happens after it's built. How are you going to, how are you going to upkeep it? Um, also, yeah, I'm beating the same drum here, aren't I? So you have the, you have the integrating the systems into broader uh, sanitation strategies. So making sure that if you have those systems there, that they're going to be close to the sludge treatment facilities. And that was, that is not the case in, in many of these. Um, also increased awareness raising um, to have, you know, increased demand for both, you know, use of these systems, but also willingness to pay for these systems. Uh, capacity building for, for governments, again, same, same, very, very similar sort of thing I'm saying here, right? Also, um, sort of just agreements in place uh, between local governments and the KPPs uh, for, for their operations. Um, also, some basic design uh, improvements that, that could be, um, that could be done, um, but also piloting uh, new, new technologies. I think this is my last slide. Um, also, for those systems that are not operating, then rather than um, you know keep building new ones, um, you know just rehabilit rehabilitate them. It's a it's a fraction of the cost that would be to to build a new one. Um, something that's that's sort of close to my heart is making sure you have financial models for these things, like have that in place, have that have that uh, have that really planned out, you know, in detail. You know, any contracts. Um, should include, you know, operating expense for five to 10 years, just, you know, as, as part of, of, of your initial, initial outlay. Um, and then make sure, yeah, and then you're allocating sufficient budgets uh, for the soft components. So all these different things, whether it's surveys or databases, capacity building, all the rest of these things. And that is my presentation. Here is some contact information. And yeah, I'll hand it back over. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, so now just we'll move into the Q&A. So if you have questions um, for the speakers, please throw some in the Q&A. But I just wanted to start with one. Um, in thinking about where we need to build capacity for financing, conservation finance solutions to solve this issue, this is a question for both of you. What are the like one to three top recommendations or asks for where philanthropy or private investors could um, put some put some funds or effort? I don't. Should should I go first? Go for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we we always see this need to one have more access to self-funding because in the end you know that these are non-profit um or organizations so they knew, do need a lot of support when it comes to making sure that they can invest to have a staffing uh to continue operating to maybe have an emergency fund as well uh but i guess the key element of this is making sure that uh, you support the organizations that are managing and are, are going to be the face and dealing with the day-to-day -day activities that comes with these projects. And I, I keep stressing on this because it's something that I've seen in many locations. They have great facilities being donated, but there's no one to manage them. So in the end, you end up doing more harm than good. So I would say a, a key point is investing to make sure that there is governance and that there is someone uh, managing and operating the systems. And, so, and I guess that alongside the management model that you need to make sure that happens as well. So on my side, uh, not being a sanitation specialist, I have, we'll say, limited sort of depth, we'll say, of, of, of sort of my perspective. Um, but sort of how this came about was looking at um, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropy's sort of, uh, we'll say, entry into Indonesia, working on sort of coral reefs and what they should work on. Um, 
And part of that was looking at the landscape of who's working on sanitation in Indonesia. And there's just not that many organizations that are doing this work. And I think so that's a long way of sort of trying to say, it just seems like there's just not a lot compared to like fisheries and MPAs, where it seems like there's just a ton of different organizations working there. I just, I, com comparing that to what I saw in the sanitation side, it's just like, it's a huge mismatch, I would say. Um, so just more generally, just more people getting involved, more, more, um, more funding there. It's just, it's, it's not even close, at least, at least for my sort of, we'll say the small perspective that I have. Thank you. And as a follow-up, I think you both sort of mentioned the operations and maintenance models being challenging as well. And um, as well as having to like find all these different, especially Tanya, finding all these different sources of um, funding. Um, would it make sense if we had you know, organizations really working on developing and sharing O&M models and, and financing solutions as well? Yeah, absolutely. We've knocked on so many doors that I, I wouldn't finish the, the list if I started creating that as well. But we do believe in um, the power that access to information and resources. But when I mention resources, it's not just the financial ones. It can be technical assistance. It can be in a, a link uh, on something that you can read. So I would say yes, um, sharing the experiences, sharing the challenges as well, because all success stories have a lot of challenges. I think it's definitely worth it. In fact, we're working right now on creating this catalog of management models based on um, situations that we have seen in different communities that are not like West End. But in the end, what we want to do with this is make sure that if you are interested in improving your sanitation, you can browse through different options and see which one might work for you. It could be an exact replica or it can be uh, building blocks or some components of the ones that you're seeing. So I would, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, same here, resounding yes. I mean, if, if you don't have a financial plan, you don't have a plan. Like if, if you have an asset, you don't have a plan to, to operate it, then that should be priority number one is to have something like that. Um, it sounds like we're sort of answering this other question that I have, we have in the Q&A, which is what is the best way um, to make these initiatives self-sustainable and not grant dependent? But maybe we just answered that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as, as someone, this, I mean, this is across different contexts, right? I'm thinking about this in, in terms of like fishery improvement projects, in terms of MPAs, right? If you have, you know, you're gonna have costs, you need to figure out a way, you need to figure out how much those costs are going to be. And then you need to figure out what your, who your customers are essentially, and how much you need to charge them for, to cover your costs over time or how to, how to plug the gaps that you do have. That's, that's, that's the, that's the, those are the basics basically. Here's another question um, in the chat. How can those of us working on advanced wastewater treatment facilities and Wealthy countries best support and assist in communication and implementation of best practices in other places. Where do we start? <laughs> but I think that, <laughs> you know, something that we've noticed is that we all have something to learn from another practitioner. So I think that's something that uh, we should all be doing, just continue sharing these experiences, being an advocate as well, because maybe you cannot directly support one initiative or a particular project, but you know someone who might be able to do so. Um, also, I, I believe that seeing uh, situations where some, some project reach, reaches a desirable state, it's an inspiration. As I mentioned, it took us uh, over 10 years to make sure that we are where we are and that's just after the plant was built but what goes in the years before where you feel like something is impossible so sharing through technical support technical assistance advocacy fundraising there are many things that that can be done from the position that you're in so yeah everyone can can contribute i i like that question and i yeah, I mean, yeah, how do, how do you like take the learnings that, you know, like, how do you not reinvent the wheel? Like, how do you take what was already sort of learned in one context and apply it to another? Like, how do you actually get that information 
from one person's brain and get into like a, a you know a format that can be that can be accessed by by others i am someone should be working on that basically that sounds like a, a great idea is there a platform for sharing um information right now or is it more of a case of building individual relationships at this point i would advocate a platform i don't know if one exists or not yeah, I think it's a it's a mix, right, of making sure that we can strengthen the platforms that already exist, the working groups, roundtables, but also uh, building those one-on-one -on -one relationships. But ideally, we would have a, a larger platform. But for now, where we are is different working groups, perhaps per region. Um, that's the situation, I guess, at, at the moment. Um, and I should share for participants that um, I sit on the steering committee of a new organization called the Ocean Sewage Alliance, which is also trying to kind of create um, kind of network and collaborations across the sector. So maybe that's something for us to think about too. Uh, another question in the context of ocean pollution, is there any evidence that the introduction of sanitation systems has led to improvement in the impact in the marine environment? Um, so maybe that's a question for you, Tanya. Yes, definitely. And, and it's also a matter, uh, a matter of focusing on the stressors to the reef. So there's still a lot of monitoring that needs to happen to make sure that those correlations continue to be established and assessed. Uh, but definitely you don't want to see situations where the reef is under a lot of stress when it comes to uh, increase of water temperature. So you have a lot of bleaching events, climate change, and then you add pollution to that mix, while also the reef is dealing with uh, stony coral tissue loss disease. So I, I, I think that in the end, the more that you reduce stressors, the bigger the positive outcome is going to be. So, so I, I think it's, and it's also, as I was mentioning, something that's connected to conservation of other species in, and well-being. So, and if you look at the value that the reef has to uh, all, everything that goes around it, uh, the communities that live off it through fishing, uh, I think it's worth investing in sanitation, which is a big challenge, but I think that it's, it's one that's manageable. And, and I'll add that, um, you know, there isn't a lot of, there aren't a lot of examples where this um, sort of impact has been monitored and measured. And so, you know, wherever there are sanitation improvements made in the ocean, it would be super helpful to build that evidence base as well. Um, just looking at the questions. What would you both say um, important, interesting aspects in wastewater sanitation program for funders. So what, what attracts funding to these programs? I would say that something that attracts funding is, uh, I don't want to sound repetitive, but I think it's all the indirect beneficiaries that you can have from investing in, in sanitation. So it's a big, it's a high impact investment. Uh, and sometimes what you need to do is something very specific, but I, I'm going to give you just one clear example of how we can also improve um, sanitation and wastewater treatment uh, in, in Tela, which is a small community in the North Coast. Uh, right now, the challenge that they're having is that they are not able to support water quality monitoring efforts because they don't have someone in their staff that is trained to use a specific kind of equipment that they have it and they received as a donation. Um, so what do you need to kickstart this process or reactivate it again is make sure that you can create this connection between the person that can do the training, which we already have at, at BICA, to work with uh, this water and sanitation service provider. And uh, that's what they need to reactivate it. But sometimes uh, providers, whether it's a private organization, it's a municipality, it's a community, uh, they are dealing with big challenge on a daily basis. And sometimes they don't have access to the information or the people that can support them. So I, I think that's also an, an example of what can make uh, perhaps someone donating travel expenses for that person and, and the impact that it can have, which is uh, making sure that we have baseline information 
uh, for water quality monitoring and seeing how the plant is doing or what other um, pollution sources are reaching that area. So I just wanted to share that very specific example. And I'll just echo my presentation as well. I, th I think a way to attract more funding to the space is to show that funds that are already being spent are being spent well, and they're being and they're effective and effectively managed. So I'll finish with a, a final question. So coming to the top of the hour, but what gives you hope? Question for both of you. What gives me hope is. Uh, well, seeing that so many people have joined this network of support for the Water Association and the fact that I'm here talking to you about this is something that brings me hope because you can see the value in all of that hard work. And, and that's what makes you uh, be so persistent when you're dealing with a long-term project like, like this. And for me, I'll just say that, you know, a lot of money is being spent which means it's getting more awareness, it's getting more attention, um, and there are plans to spend more money. And there's just, a, I mean, when you do that, right, yes, there's, there'll be hiccups along the way, there'll be, be bumps, but I mean, you're learning as you go and hopefully uh, improving. So I think things can only get, get better. Fantastic. Thank you both of you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, everyone who listened in. Uh, the recording of this will be posted um, on Conservation Finance Science website. And so would it be on the Octo website as well? Yes, yes, we'll have it posted uh, awesome. in a few hours. Yeah. Thank you. We'll close this for now and appreciate everyone's time. Thank you.